What if Altist has blessed us with another one of his wonderful overly long videos on a topic he's not too well versed on? This time it's communism. But while he set out to deliver a critique of communist ideology, he largely fails at this as I'll show, and there are many reasons why. A big one that he admits to is the fact that he didn't read a single word of Marx, Engels, Lenin, or any other communist when formulating his critique. But that's because at its heart, his video is not a critique. If it was, he'd directly critique communist text. His video is instead a defense of his own worldview and values, values that he believes the communists are going to destroy. I started writing this video as an attempt to understand communist civilization, which briefly ruled one-third of the human race in the middle of the 20th century. I didn't succeed at that. A problem I often see with philosophy is that it can become navel-gazing or intellectual masturbation that's intellectually disconnected from the actual physical evidence. As a side tangent, in ancient philosophy there was magic, that and then there was left-handed magic, which was magic that came from you trying to take divine power by yourself. And right-hand magic came through God's goodwill, or and left-hand magic had to come through causing suffering for other people and taking energy from elsewhere leftist politics, that humans are inherently perfectible and can become gods. Left hemisphere worldviews operate through an abdication of responsibility. Marxism is the exemplification of a failed left hemisphere worldview, and isn't it kind of ironic that it's left-wing politics, left-hand magic, and left hemisphere? I understand this is kind of woo-woo, but I just thought it would be fun to throw in here. My video is not about convincing you of the merits of any communistic ideology. If you want that, then there are plenty of videos like that out there. We still need communism. Uh. If I say anything positive about a communist country's policies or any such thing in this video, it's specifically because what Walt Hist falsely alleged the opposite. Some of the worst things he's saying in this video have nothing to do with communism. It's the sort of stuff you're not going to catch unless you're acutely aware of the context surrounding the terms and ideas floated. The main purpose of this video is threefold. Critique what Walt Hist's arguments, provide evidentiary material and context through primary sources in a way he failed to do, so that you will actually have a deeper understanding of the fundamental ideas that underpin communist ideology, and explain the nature and history of some of the ideas floated by what Walt Hist as counterarguments to communism. I'm going to use bits of what Walt Hist footage in order to illustrate some of the points he's trying to make, and I will try my best not to completely misrepresent his points, though we are essentially speaking different languages when it comes to history, so it's going to be hard. I'll try really hard to get on the same wavelength as in the same vibrations, you might say. When I'm showing his footage, there will be a timestamp on screen for when the footage appears in his original video. I'll also be interspersing some of my live initial reactions to the video from when I first watched it. If you've read or listened to any critiques of communism, then much of what you'll see in this video is not new or all that exciting. These critiques are also, generally speaking, not even very good, never really delving into specific failures of communist regimes, revolutions, or movements in general. Much of the verifiable material critique that is levied can be applied to any government or regime. Many people died as a result of the actions of communist regimes. Many people also died as a result of the actions of capitalist regimes. Highlighting one or the other is not a very compelling argument against either one. The very first thing you should do when evaluating someone's analysis of history is to look at their sources. This is a bit problematic with what fault is since he doesn't do proper source citation. In fact, he didn't list a bibliography until just now with this video, and that's only because I raised a big stink about it. One time, there is a communist YouTuber who criticized me and made a lengthy video doing so, and I wrote down all the criticisms he made of me, such as, this guy does no research, he just says what's on his mind, he's just speaking off the cuff, he's a narcissist. It's me! Because the, the sources, it, it has to be. That's fucking funny. Still, this is a huge step forward, even if this isn't really how you should do a bibliography. In terms of formatting it, it should generally contain the year the work was published and be ordered alphabetically by author. It should also only be noted if it was explicitly used in the research for this video, not if it's just something on the topic that you've read or something that served as an inspiration, though you can still mention that in the video. I'm going to probably make a video on how one should cite sources and construct a bibliography in the future. Hopefully he will watch that one too. In terms of outright critiquing these sources, I haven't read them all and they're never explicitly cited to the page number in the video, so I'd have to scan the entirety of each work to try to figure out if any of his claims correspond to any of the evidence given in these books every time he makes a claim over the course of this 15 minute video. I'm not going to do that, so my source critique here will have to be relatively light. I have thoughts on a lot of these sources, but I think those are irrelevant to the point of this video and would only get us bogged down in the minutia. I genuinely do appreciate the step forward here though, partially because this list of sources shows that for his video on communism, what if Altist did not read 
a single word of Marx or Engels. I can promise this will not go into the direction you expect. My comrade, let's make the revolution. The whole world was experiencing acute overpopulation and so that meant human life was very cheap. The idea that poverty is a product of overpopulation was fronted by Thomas Malthus in his famous essay on the principle of population from 1789. What if Altis presents this thesis as fact, even though Malthusian thinking has largely been disproven at this point. Poverty causes faster population growth, but poverty itself mainly has political and institutional causes, not demographic ones. If you want to learn more, read the cited article by J. Van Babel from Facts, Views and Vision, an international peer-reviewed scientific journal for obstetrics, gynecology and reproductive of health. The suffering wrought in the period was due to the economic, political, and institutional responses to the changing world and lack thereof, not population growth itself. Working 12-hour days, six days a week, was often the norm. There are stories of wealthy social reformers trying to push for an eight-hour workday in this time period, followed by riots by the workers since they would starve if they worked those four less hours. It's somewhat absurd to bring up this relative edge case in a long history of workers fighting tooth and nail to work less hours for the same pay. The eight-hour workday was a fundamental position of the socialist movements of the period, one which attracted a lot of support and one that was eventually won and is enjoyed by workers to this day. Karl Marx, in his usual non-moralistic manner argued specifically that working long hours was counterproductive to society. Quote, the unnatural extension of the working day, which capital necessarily strives for in its unmeasured drive for self-valorization, shortens the life of the individual worker and therefore the duration of his labor power. It would seem therefore that the interest of capital itself points in the direction of a normal working day. What Waterfeld Hist is trying to do here by highlighting an edge case like this is to create a notion that the socialists of the period were disconnected from the real concerns of the working class in a very disingenuous way. Let me ask you, dear viewer, would you rather work 8 hours or 14 hours? The traditional social structure in which almost everyone was an independent renting farmer was replaced by employer-employee relationships, which, due to inexperience and overpopulation, were often incredibly exploitive and cruel. In some ways, it's useful to view it as similar to the current political polarization, collapse in dating and loneliness that has come with the internet which we are struggling with today as a society. It took about four minutes for the insult theory dating stuff to come up. Loneliness is a problem. Feeling alienated from society is a problem. I wonder if someone has any theories on social alienation one could use as a framework for analyzing these issues. Now, he is right to point these things out, and I'd argue he's even right to make the comparison. But it is perhaps valuable to analyze how dating has increasingly been modified through apps and other services by for-profit corporations, who are not only alienating you from your labor, but now are also alienating you from pussy. Though I think a more productive way of directly dealing with this problem in the short term is to shower more and bring up the quote-unquote fundamental differences between men and women less. The vision Marx created was one where the rich oppressed the poor in a system that kept the working man down. In summary, this is Marx's entire philosophy. Marx did not create this vision. These were concrete realities observed by contemporaries, including him. I think we both agree on this since you literally outlined this exploitation just minutes earlier in the video. That's also a complete mischaracterization of Marx. His philosophy could instead be oversimplified as classes broadly and generally acting in their own economic interests. It was his belief that the class interests of the exploited would eventually lead to their self-emancipation from exploitation. It logically follows from this that the exploiters would be incentivized to prevent said emancipation, and thus you have class struggle. It's ironic Karl Marx blamed capitalism on the poor's oppression, given the exact opposite actually turned out to be true. You could see the exact same problems of poverty and class repression in societies that were not capitalist by his definition. That's because Marx never claimed that, which you would know if you had actually read Marx. He claims that the bourgeoisie carried out the revolutions which supplanted the feudal lords, which then did afford a lot of people rights and privileges they did not have under feudalism. His argument is that there have always been oppressors and the oppressed, and that the mechanisms of this and the forms this has taken has varied throughout history. Capitalism did end past systems of exploitation, and supplanted it with new systems of capitalist exploitation. The capitalists, in becoming the new ruling class, went from being oppressed by feudal lords to the oppressors of the worker. Karl Marx doesn't quote unquote blame capitalism. He in fact highlights capitalism as providing the instruments by which the worker will liberate themselves. This is the most basic sort of elementary Marxism that you find even in the very short theory light Communist Manifesto, which is more of a PR pamphlet than real theory. There's even more nuance in Das Kapital. So to round up this point, no, you don't see the exact same kind of class repression, but you do see a different kind of class repression in non-capitalist countries, since their economies are different by nature of them not being capitalist. And Marx never made any argument against this. He literally agrees 
with you on this, which you would know had you read him. The mid-19th century was tough everywhere except North America, and around the Third World we saw horrifying wars and rebellions break out across the world as a reaction. <laughs> Yeah, slavery, failed reconstruction, there's a lot that was going on in America that was not good. And it's ironic that he talks about how the mid-19th century was pretty cool in America, as opposed to in the third world where there was, like, there was war and rebellion, which never happened in America in the mid-19th century. My favorite recurring What If Altist bit is the one where he forgets that slavery, the Trail of Tears, and the Civil War happened. Life was decidedly still very tough in North America, which also saw a pretty brutal war and several rebellions. And the famine of 1876, which killed 70 million people around the world, or more than World War II. When Marx was writing, this looked to be the path Western Europe would go down. However, the irony is that the exact opposite happened. That's because Marx was watching something like this happen in real time in Western Europe. Ireland was experiencing what's become known as the Great Hunger, or the Irish Potato Famine in other countries. The Great Hunger had a multitude of reasons, but it was anything but a natural occurrence. It is true that potatoes died of blight, but single crop reliance is a product of human society and its needs and wants, and the fact of the matter is, Ireland was producing enough food to feed itself twice over. The food just wasn't staying in Ireland. Quoting George Bernard Shaw, Man and the Superman from 1903, My father died of starvation in Ireland in the Black 47. Maybe you've heard of it. To which Violet responds, the famine? And Malone replies, no, the starvation. When a country is full of food and exporting it, there can be no famine. Though factors preceding the spread of the potato blight for sure had deep impacts on the death toll of the great dying, it's perhaps the lackluster response to it that had the greatest effect, chief of which under the Whigs was to secure the export profits of the English absentee landlords, cancel government relief efforts in favor of letting the market sort it out, and providing aid based on output or merit of the individual Irish worker. The result was that those who had already been debilitated by the situation were debilitated further. The famine was viewed by the English in a Malthusian fashion. Relief, according to them, only exacerbated the problem because it led the Irish to propagate, further straining their resources. Ignoring completely, of course, that Ireland was producing enough food, it was just being exported because the farms had been bought up by profit-seeking owners, also known as capitalists, in the year prior. In fact, the Irish-born American Archbishop of New York, John Hughes, reasoned that had profits been curtailed by as little as 3 or 4 percent per year during the crisis, it would have saved many lives and yet not inflicted a wound or scar on the health of commerce. The irony is that Marx said that communist revolutions would only happen in the very most developed nations. I don't think Marx actually said this. He provides no source as usual, so it's not like I could just read the source and verify. In his letter to the Russian socialist Vera Zazulich in 1881, two years before he died, he explicitly said that the specific course of revolution he outlined would only take place in Western Europe, and his writings in Capital make no argument for or against revolutions of any other kind in any other countries. He explicitly says that socialist revolution in Russia may occur through an alternate pathway focusing on the Russian peasantry, which I think is what What Vault Hist here is arguing happened, so once again Marx and What Vault Hist are in agreement. The world order totally changes and the laws of Darwinistic competition just stop, while at the same time that if we are good and do the right thing, you can break the laws of the universe. However, this is just not true, where Darwinistic struggle and life being hard is just normal across history no matter what happens, and will never change. It's wonderful that you brought up the book where you supposedly got this idea, because it gives me a chance to investigate the evidence for your claim. Here is the author on page 144 of the very book you just mentioned. The evolutionary logic in itself has no normative implications. It can inform us about human natural predispositions, the often ignored effects of which we would be wise to take into account, but which are often variable and even contradictory. We may choose to follow such predispositions or rebel against them. There is nothing sacred or morally compelling about maximizing the survival for the fittest. This is merely the blind algorithmic mechanism of natural quote-unquote design. The human brain itself a product of evolution and a powerful instrument of conscious, purposeful, and future-oriented rather than blind design may come up with more satisfactory arrangements. Darwinism may thus be regarded as our key to understanding nature, but as mostly irrelevant for understanding human society shaped by culture. Communists don't think about how money is produced, rather how it is divided. Here's the table of contents of the Penguin Classics version of Capital Volume 1, a thousand-page book written by Karl Marx about how money is produced. Marxism is in many ways 
an apocalyptic philosophy in that it thinks that there will come a point where the working classes drive out the rich and then we live in a utopia forever after. However, the actual thing communism tells you is kill the rich and install an autocratic state and has no sense of moral values or moral standards. Communism says that rulers are purely evil and the oppressed are purely good. No, in fact, communist texts generally do not at all say that. Marx especially largely avoided any sort of moralistic conceptions in all he wrote. It's ironic that you'd say there's both a moral impetus to quote-unquote kill the rich because they are deemed irredeemably evil, while also claiming there is no sense of moral values. There is most definitely a large contingent of people who despise the actions of certain rich people and so call for these kinds of things. And that is sometimes driven by envy, sometimes driven by genuine grievance towards some pretty awful actions. Grievance can drive people towards communist ideology, but to speak of any trend being the dominant here in contemporary communist thought is a fool's errand because it's quite diverse. So let's address each point with a source. Engels says in Principles of Communism under point 16, will the peaceful abolition of private property be possible? That it would be desirable if this could happen, and the communists would certainly be the last to oppose it. Communists historically have viewed revolution as an inevitable response to repression, and have not been opposed to peacefully achieving their aims. In point 18 under what will be the course of this revolution? Revolution. The very first thing Engels mentions is that, above all, it will establish a democratic constitution and, through this, the direct or indirect dominance of the proletariat. Among the main points of immediate concern was ensuring free education for all children. Spooky. Finally, he flashes the murdered Romanovs on screen about the point of killing off the ruling classes. The irony of which is that the communists did in fact not wish to kill the Romanovs, some for practical concerns of international reputation, some because it genuinely seemed like a worthless and barbaric thing to do once they had already won power. The Romanovs were allowed to live in house arrest in great estates, with servants still accompanying them for about a year after the Tsar's abdication. We have no proof of who ordered the execution, but the sudden and improvisational nature of it on the approach of the White Army gives credence to the belief that it was carried out on the orders of some lower-ranking officer in charge of their imprisonment. Emperor Pu Yi of China, after having been captured by the Soviets and handed over to the Chinese communists, was put on trial and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. He received a formal pardon in 1959 and later became a researcher at the Institute of Literature and History under the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. He wrote an autobiography called From Emperor to Citizen. There are some pretty messed up communists in history who have done some pretty messed up things. But as what Walt Hiss said himself, reality is complicated. And editorializing his words a little bit here, the same people can be capable of doing good or bad things. He said this in defense of the Tsar of Imperial Russia, whose secret police was arguably far worse than that under Lenin, a secret police which is alleged to have inflamed brutal pogroms against the Russian Jewish population between 1903 to 1906. He's altogether willing to extend this emperor some charitability, but not the young woman whose picture is using for holding a sign at a protest. I promise the critique is going to speed up a little here, but I need to very clearly illustrate how what Waldtist is not actually arguing against any points or ideas posited by Karl Marx. He's arguing against his idea of Marx, a straw man or a ghost, a specter of communism if you will. Oh, it's pretty clear at this point that, in preparation for his critique, he did not read the words of Marx or Engels, leaving him woefully unequipped to have an understanding of communist ideology. This lack of investigation into the actual sources and complete lack of inquisitiveness renders his critique rather hollow and ineffectual. He in fact chose the explicit text of John Lennon's Imagine as an example of a quote-unquote explicit retelling of the Communist Manifesto. As another example, take John Lennon's song Imagine, which posits a world without heaven, hell, nothing to live for or die for, where there is no vision or suffering. This is a very feminine ideal for life, since women are not competitive, and when I first heard the song, I didn't know why other people found it attractive. While never ever showing any text written by Marx or Engels, this is insanely fucking funny and just completely absurd. His critique falls especially flat when he brings up points Marx himself made as examples of things that he never considered. This is a very common occurrence among those who have exclusively consumed anti-communist literature or more often YouTube videos or lectures, and never actually investigated what the man himself actually said or meant. That's not to say you have to read pro-communist literature to understand communism. It just might be a good idea to read what Marx said if you're going to talk about what Marx said. This should be obvious. He was widely known as a cruel and authoritarian person, and even racist, even for his time, as well as a plagiarist. Why don't we actually follow men we respect?
This is not a great line of attack, considering your worldview is strongly influenced by Oswald Spengler. In this 1939 issue of the Virginia Quarterly Review, a national journal of literature and discussion, Carl Dreher talks about how Spengler's relationship to the Nazi party waxed and waned, and how his philosophy and ultranationalism provided much of the skeleton for Nazi ideology. Spengler, of course, also voted for Adolf Hitler over Hindenburg in 1932, but would decide he was unimpressed with Nazism. Spengler, just like Marx, lived in a specific context, and it's fine to judge them by the values we hold today as what a Valtist is doing. It's hard to judge them by any values we don't hold, after all. Marx wasn't particularly racist for the time. Chief evidence for his anti-Semitism tends to stem from him actually trying to refute his friend Bauer's anti-Semitism. I'm referring to the text on the Jewish question, which was titled as such because it was a response to his friend's anti-Semitic work, The Jewish Question. Adding on the followed by the title is a way of saying this is a commentary on the thusly titled work. Even if that particular example isn't the best, you can easily find examples of Marx's anti-Semitic and anti-black racism in letters to his friend Ferdinand LaSalle, while he at the same time was a staunch abolitionist supporting the end to slavery in America and the emancipation of Jews from oppression. So while I have no doubt he was racist, he likely wasn't more racist than a lot of people of his time. This is the mid-1800s after all, when a significant portion of America decided to revolt against the state in order to preserve the institution of racial slavery, and anti-Semitism was everywhere in Europe. It's ironic that in my defense here of Marx, I am doing a far better job than what about his of actually showing you his terrible racism by giving you concrete concrete examples you can look up yourself, instead of levying a baseless character assassination. Nothing what a his says is sourced, but I do know for a fact that the evidence of Marx's infidelity is spurious at best, and is based on a rumor long after Marx's death, based on a letter written by a third party that claims that Engels had confessed on his deathbed that his child with Marx's maid actually belonged to Marx himself. Did you follow all that? This letter was only written after the maid had also died, meaning none of it could ever be verified. This entire part of what a his video is very silly. I wanted to use this as a jumping off point to talk more about anti-Semitism. Cue the anti-Semitism supercut. Marx lived and wrote in the middle of the 19th century and was a secularized Jew. He is a secularized Jew. Secular Jews across history, they often push an incredibly nihilistic view of the world. They don't believe that life has any meaning. They don't believe that the nation or social communities have any positive good attached to them. And you see several philosophic trajectories that are shared among secular Jews due to this feeling of rejection by the broader society. One of the biggest demographics for communism is again secular Jews for this very reason. If you look across the Jews who have had many philosophic and religious innovations that have been incredibly positive across history, whether Einstein, Spinoza, Jesus, Moses, and more, even though Jewish philosophy has many positives, there are several cognitive bugs that you see across it, and one of it is apocalyptic thinking. Marxism is in many ways an apocalyptic philosophy and that it thinks that there were- Before I explain this, I have to make it very clear that I have no idea if what if Altis genuinely holds explicitly malicious anti-Semitic beliefs. What I do know is that he is prone to referencing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and is in this video drawing a link between Judaism and communism. In the comments of my recent video on him, I drew some criticism and rightly so for not spelling out in no uncertain terms how what if Altis was being anti-Semitic when he kept referencing the total infiltration of academia, the media, finance and the government by Jewish Marxists starting with the Frankfurt School. A big line of criticism around this was that what about his doesn't draw links between them being Jews and Marxists. Well, guess what, motherfucker? Let me emphasize once again that what about his may not be a raging anti-Semite. He may genuinely be completely ignorant of how he is engaging with very old and established anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. After all, we've seen that he has a somewhat relaxed relationship to the concept of sources and source critique. This link is an absurd one, and there isn't anything inherently Jewish about Marxism or anything inherent to Marxism that necessarily attracts Jewish people. These are aspects of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy theory. And to the credit of what if Altist, I do not think he holds the same sort of Judeo-Bolshevik theory as the Nazis. I do, however, believe that he may have sourced this rationale from anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, or found himself surrounded by people who uncritically parrot these theories. On December 26th, he said some pretty weird stuff about Jews on Twitter, starting with, I like the Jews, but, after which nothing good will ever follow. The list of Jews he notes as pushing materialist or atheist ideas include many of the people he put up on 
this slide. And in this thread, under a now deleted reply asking for the title of the book forwarding the thesis that Word Vault Hist here is presenting, he responds that he got it from Culture of Critique by MacDonald. If you want to look the book up, you'll find the Wikipedia page for the book series carries the following marker. MacDonald is a white supremacist anti Semitic conspiracy theorist. When Holocaust denier David Irving was suing American historian Deborah Lipstadt for claiming that he was indeed a Holocaust denier, MacDonald was the only willing witness who testified on behalf of David Irving. He also once again mentions Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, which, while not being overtly anti Semitic, is not cited much by academia, but a lot by right wing conspiracy theorists, many of whom are anti Semitic, due to the allegations of powerful individuals secretly pulling these strings of society fitting well within their worldview. Read the linked article if you want to know more. What about his? may not be a raging anti-Semite, but he's using sources that are either overtly anti-Semitic or are frequently utilized by anti-Semites. This coupled by the fact that he is trying to draw a link between Jews or a Jewish mindset and Marxism should be somewhat worrying. Perhaps there is an interesting thesis here, but if you wanted to present it, you would have to provide a lot of evidentiary material and do a lot more groundwork on preventing your material's misuse by anti-Semites than what what Evald Hist is doing. Finally, I'd like to point out that one of the quote-unquote good Jews he highlights here is Albert Einstein, who was a very smart and admirable man. I'm going to quote now from an essay he published in the Monthly Review in 1949, which you can find published in its online version in 2009. Production is carried on for profit, not for use. There is no provision that all those able and willing to work will always be in a position to find employment. An army of unemployed almost always exists. The worker is constantly in fear of losing his job. This crippling of individuals I consider the worst evil of capitalism. Our whole educational system suffers from this evil. An exaggerated competitive attitude is inculcated into the student, who is trained to worship acquisitive success as a preparation for his future career. I am convinced there is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an educational system which would be oriented towards social goals. This essay is called Why Socialism, and as you can see, Albert Einstein was also a socialist. We all know what happened at this point. After seizing power in Russia and China, Communism spread across most of Asia and had experiments basically everywhere else in the world. What followed is the bloodiest event ever in history by a significant margin. His real critique of past socialist regimes is relegated to just a tiny bit of the video, and for the most part rehashes tired tropes of bringing up death counts, birth rates, standard of living, and GDP per capita. There are a bunch of outright lies here, like East and West Germany or North and South Korea having the exact same material starting point, which is just outright false and nonsensical. For example, North Korea Korea actually had a much better starting point in terms of industry, and a far worse one in terms of agriculture. North Korea's economic recovery was far better than South Korea's, though they received far less foreign support than South Korea, whose economy eventually surpassed that of North Korea in the 1970s. I was going to address more of these, but the criticisms once again aren't very interesting or good. For the most part, it's the same tired, generic anti-communist trope of equating all deaths in communist regimes and tying them explicitly to their ideology with absolutely zero context, giving here a death toll of about six. 67 million. The source of which, by the way, attributes the North Korean famine of the 1990s to land redistribution. Land redistribution which took place a whole half a century before then. A lot of this land redistribution was about redistributing land which had been seized from the old Japanese colonial overlords. Also, his source itself objects to treating communism itself as a deadly event, which is exactly how what a politist decided to use it. So why does he do this? To what end? What practical intellectual purpose does any of this serve? None. One could apply the very same methodology to capitalism nations, and even if one were to restrict themselves exclusively to wars by capitalist nations that occurred between the years 1914 and 1992, you'd still end up with a conservative death toll of 123 million, far higher than the supposed communist death toll. I'm not trying to relativize the brutality here, I'm trying to show you how insanely stupid this line of argumentation is. It accomplishes nothing, it's pure ideology. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting. In my videos, I've consistently called communism a religion. This is since, according to Durkheimian terms, it totally is. The main reason communists really get pissed off at calling them a religion is they view all religions as false, as according to Marx, now we get to the core of the thesis of this video. It only took us about half an hour. The way he positions communism as a religion and the reasons for it are actually quite interesting. Before we get to that though, Emil Durkheim was a sociologist with left-wing political sympathies. What about his doesn't exactly cite where he got these so-called Durkheimian terms from, and Emil Durkheim never appears in his list of sources. Luckily, I think I found what he's working off of in Durkheim's The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, page 47. The problematic part of how Wadavaltis is using this definition comes from the fact that Durkheim was not 
intending to create a definition to be used to ascertain if something was religion. Instead, he was looking for the social role religion played in society and studying commonalities between religions. In other words, Durkheim's research is meant to help you understand what you already know to be a religion, not to identify what is and isn't a religion. Durkheim is trying to explain religions, not find religions. I consider this somewhat of a misuse of a source. What Voltist's arguments for why communism is a religion are more so suited to paint it as an ideology, which it no doubt is, rather than a religion, which it isn't. Any argument he is positing here can be turned towards any one of his beliefs. By his own terms, is his anti-communism not a religion? Communism and anti-communism are both ideologies. Religions are also ideological, but not all ideologies are religion. The final point on Marx saying all religions are false is also untrue or perhaps a misuse of a source. Marx said in his famous quote, Religion is the opium of the masses. It is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. What he's saying here is that religion serves as a means of comfort and spiritual relief that the hardships experienced now will be worth it due to the rewards in the afterlife. He's characterizing religion here as a coping mechanism that serves a pretty important role in society. It was the view of Marx and Engels that religion would lose its important role in society and therefore slowly fade from existence when humans stopped chasing a future happiness in the afterlife and attained a real happiness in the present. Marx quite literally frames religion as a real and important part of society, even if only temporarily so. And the peasants used Christianity as a motivating factor to keep going in a hard world and one with severe hierarchies that were often oppressive. At one point, he goes on a tangent about the roots of Marxism lying in Gnosticism, which I genuinely do not care about, and seems like another strange way to paint Marxists as smug, knowledge-hoarding mystics who operate through secret societies. For communism, from Gnostic. Do you see his, um, his top, uh, his, his top recommended video is a Taylor Swift cover? I don't give a shit about this part of the video. And his detractors will tell me that, uh, or my detractors, his fans, will tell me that I'm not listening to his arguments, but I don't think you should have to listen to someone's arguments about how uh, nuking Mars is a really good idea when you're talking about communism. Because those two things don't really relate. Like, I don't give a shit about Gnosticism. <laughs> Like, why Why would I? Just read the fucking... He hasn't even read the manifesto, I don't think. ...to study Marxism more, even if you've read thousands of pages I have, since they... Oh, as you have! What pages? Let's see. Um, okay, so he has read thousands of pages on the subject. Secular Age, Atrocities, The Origins of Ideology by David Christian, Sex and Power in History, Europe by Norman Davies, Conflict of Visions. Um, where the fuck is Marx on this list? Hello? <laughs> Do you know why they tell you to fucking study Marxism or communism uh, when, when you say this shit? It's because you haven't read Marx or any other communist. You don't have to agree with them, but you really should read them if you're going to refute their arguments. I did honestly try to make sense of it. Since I'm not knowledgeable enough about Gnosticism to really try to entangle this mess, I asked my Discord mod who's really into this stuff, and he got really upset. He said, what if Altis is drawing a tenuous connection between Gnosticism and Communism based on a somewhat materialist view appearing in both? If one were to actually refute his arguments here, one would probably have to make an entire video about it. And although I'm not absolutely sure he's wrong, since I'm not knowledgeable on this, I do feel as if it'd be like spending a lot of time and energy on earnestly refuting the points made by a flat earther. However, this works as a good jumping off point. If you want to kill communism forever, improve the strengths of families, small businesses, and religion. If we find a way to return to the pre-industrial norms of everyone running their own little plot of land or business, people will feel agency in their lives as well as being stakeholders, and communism will stop making sense. If people have intact families, they will view that as a sense of agency and stabilization in their lives, rather than turning to ideologies to balance the void in their souls. Healthy religions promote mindfulness, or the idea that everything will be alright and you should stay centered and calm. Mindfulness is always good. I mentioned how this is the core of his video, and I also mentioned earlier how his video isn't so much a critique of communism as it is a defense of the things he holds dear. A defense against those he believes are out to destroy those things. In terms of time spent on various topics, discussing how left-wingers are inherently dishonest, overly feminine, delusional, and toxic takes up much more time than discussing mass killings under Josef Stalin. He speaks with way more vitriol about how the social sciences are feminine-dominated and how feminine persons want to enforce equality at the expense of merit. He talks about how intellectuals, professors, and teachers are the bulwarks of Marxist revolutionary spirit. He says smart people gravitate towards this ideology, but it's not because they're smart 
part, it's because they lack courage and are envious of businessmen and politicians who hold the real power. I'm quoting almost verbatim here. There's a timestamp on screen if you don't believe me. There are real problems, but they can't be solved through the solutions communism tries to provide, or that the social scientists try to provide. Or maybe they shouldn't. Instead, we need a return to religion and traditional values. Abandoning religion has caused us to move towards what he deems a quote-unquote cancerous religion. That is, communism. The religion we need, however, has to be modernized. It needs to be suited to modern society, and one that instills an honest and obedient attitude in the poor so the rich can trust the poor more, which promotes cross-class collaboration. For the poor to have upward social mobility, they must make sure the upper classes like them. Also, we just need mindfulness. Communism, leftism, feminism, and all of those ideas posit massive deep-set social issues. Issues that have to be confronted. It's a view of the world that might instill you with negative emotions. It might even give you bad vibes. To cap off this video, I'd like you to hear a few words from a man who spent a lot of energy on creating long macro-historical narratives to explain the economic development of societies, and spent much time thinking about how these societies might possibly develop in the future. A guy who, despite many of his flaws, like potential anti-Semitism or racism, had very good criticisms of how shit society was at the time when he wrote this. Now I know this guy is controversial, but sometimes he did make some good points. Here's Rudyard Lynch, aka What If All Test. However, modernity makes people feel much less power and like they are ants living in apartment buildings, not knowing their neighbors, working for a boss who doesn't care about them at all in a uniform large corporation, dealing with impersonal bureaucracies all the time, even in dating with dating apps. However, communism stems from a desire for power by disempowered people. Communism is driven by the two most over-socialized demographics, those being academics and the classes that are working for someone else in a large factory. All the demographics that have agency in their own lives, like small business owners, farmers, and others who are often still quite poor, tilt markedly conservative. You are alienated from the products of your labor. Your boss doesn't care about you. You live under a massive hulking bureaucracy. Society's endless desire desire for profit has even made inroads into your love life. You feel powerless. You have no agency in your life. The people who do have agency in life, the ones who don't work for someone else, the ones who own the property they live on, the landlord, the boss, the successful businessman, the politician, they all tilt markedly conservative. They're not greedy and envious like you are. They're completely happy and content with things remaining just how they are. Thank you for watching.